how long it, it basically has taken to get that uh, learning developed as a, a television project. Because I, I always find this, this sort of thing fascinating when you talk about all the sort of behind the scenes, ins and outs of trying to get something to the point where we're sitting here talking about it. Now. Well, basically, 23 years is the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the first book was published in 1991, but the, the series you guys have kept on in the intervals. But uh, people have been trying to make a movie about Landers since almost the beginning. We would get two or three inquiries a month from people saying, Oh, I want to make a movie. Uh, these are mostly people who have no experience in home money, which makes it an easy decision. <laughs> but we also thought, you know, we would actually like someone who's read the book. And a lot of the people with no experience in money had read it, but most of the people who had experience in money had not read the book. They just said, oh, well, this is getting popular, you know, you're a fan base, we'd like to make a movie. But, you know, they weren't actually interested in the story. So you don't want to do an option with someone that you don't want to trust. Thank you. So, so we did it for a long time. We've done a lot of four times for the last 23 years. And with people who seem to have fairly good prospects. Okay, none of these ever came to anything, and it became apparent to us that it is just impossible to make a two-hour movie of that book. It can't be done. And uh, in fact, uh, the last option, uh, and in fact, the present one, is with a guy named Jim Colberg, who was bound and determined to make a movie of it. And he kept renewing the option and persisting. He hired several very reputable screenwriters, Randall Wallace, and Annie Peacock. And, you know, it became apparent you just can't get there from here. Uh, meanwhile, Ron had become familiar with the books, was interested in doing a TV show, and would check back with Jim periodically and say, well, are you ready for TV yet? Right. And finally the answer was yes. I can tell you more about that. Yeah, it was, I mean, that's literally what happened. My wife is a fan of the books. My producing partner, Meryl Davis, is a fan of the books. And they realized that they shared this interest and said, so you've got to read these. I read them. I said, wow, this is really great. We the show. We called Jim. Once we did a feature, okay, I don't think it's a feature. And we, every year we made a yearly call to just, hey, how's that feature going? And uh, say, yeah, we're in there, we're in there. And then last year he said, okay, maybe it is a TV show. It's great, called Sony Television, put the deal together, took it out, pitched it, and stars snapped it up. How difficult is it, Ron, to, to find the voice of a project? Because I'm reminded you spent a few years trying to get the recurring novels up and running, and now you've got a project that you know, has a very big fan following. Does it, does it take a while as a writer to actually get into the, the, the voice and the tone of the project that you're trying to adapt? You know, to be honest, it didn't. It was fairly, I don't know, there, I, had a, I guess there was something intuitive about it that just felt right to I me. Mean, we main, I maintain Claire's point of view and first person narrative for the show, so I literally have the voice leading the way and voiceover and dialogue and you know you are with Claire all the way through the journey. And I don't know, it was just it was somewhat facile as I went through it. I'm just writing it and I had um, I had the book on on my Kindle app on the computer and I could click over to it and read the scene again and go back and I had one of my assistants pull <laughs> a very tedious journey pulled like literally every line of dialogue out of the book and put it in a separate file so I had that you know that I could go to and I could I could write a scene and take the actual scene and dialogue and put it on and then play with it to see how it would fit in the structure so I don't know there was something very it was a fun process it wasn't really torturous it just the story just laid out really well and I'd say probably the biggest part of adaptation was in the opening episode of transitioning her from the 1940s to the 18th century. That was probably the place that we moved more of the puzzle pieces around, but even that just felt like, yeah, this is the, this is basically the way it is in the book. It was just sort of, you know, truncating some events and shorthanding other things, but, you know, the story was there to be done. It was just how you did it. A lot of the story, which I love, um, is told through a lot of narratives, like flashbacks and talking about stories about how J.B. grew up. It illustrates so much about the character in the world. So are you going to be seeing a lot of those in flashbacks, or how are you handling that? Because it's very different when you're writing versus when you're watching. You we, we, we do use a lot of flashbacks. In fact, we have flashbacks to her life with Frank in the 20th century as well, that, you know, to sort of keep him present on the show and understand why she's constantly trying to get back to him. I thought that was really important. But yeah, we do flashbacks to Jamie's life, and you know, we continue to do that. For, 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 so, uh, is the first series going to handle just the first book, or are you going to try to draw bits and pieces from future books? No, just, just the first Just the first one. So did you come into this sort of having things sort of generally mapped out? With that number of books, were you sort of saying, we can do a book a season, or is it not as sort of cut and dried as that? 
Well, I think it's a general thank you. It's generally speaking, we said let's do a book a season, which I'm pretty confident we can do the second year as, as a season. And then the third book, there'd be dragons. We're trying to figure out. <laughs> that might have to be two seasons, because that's, that's a pretty big. But I should have such problems. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. Fantastical nature. So are we going to be seeing a like, certain monster that resolves and what resides in the lake somewhere? And how we're handling going through the stones and all that? Because um, the I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy when you're writing a book. <laughs> uh, the journey through the stones is interesting. I had a lot of conversations about how to realize that. And we landed on something that, I, that is kind of cool. And I think people will enjoy it. But it is a different way to go because that the challenge of playing visually what that would be, like every time travel trope just goes to the right yeah. it's been done so many times, so we opted to go a different, yeah. a different oh, like way, do you like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I, think it, I think it's a good way to do it, so, yeah, but I won't give it that. <laughs> sort of a metaphorical yeah. thing done visually, which is that easy to do. I think it's one of those hard ones where you have to get it right because it's, it's a lot of its own. Yeah. And you just yeah. don't want it to be a big light show. If it's yeah. a big light show, it becomes yeah. the sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. It just it'll take you out of the story. And I didn't want, I did not want the audience, you know, we're at pains to make it as real as we can, as authentic as we can. I didn't want something at a key moment like that to sort of pop you out into, oh, well now I'm into the visual effect there. So you have to go differently. So taking advantage of the fact that you're on a cable, it's nice that there are some quite violent scenes that happen, particularly with Jamie later on, um, when it's going to the end. So is going to be a little bit gentler, or taking the fact that you're on stars and have a little bit more liberty to kind of show? We're going to play it. Play it straight up, do it, go for it. I mean, that was one of the reasons I wanted to pitch it to a place like Stars. You wanted to go to Premium Cable because Premium Cable would let you do what the book did. I mean, it's, it was a really good match of material in that way. You know, they like the, the material, they like having those elements in their shows because that's part of the reason that you're buying Premium Cable is to see things you can't see it everywhere else. And this is a property that you don't have to add that into. You don't have to just say, well, God, we're, let's throw some nudity in here. You know? <laughs> no, that's enough going it's, it's, plenty, it's plenty of nudity. So we got it. It's, uh, we're okay on it. How difficult was the casting on this because uh, people have such a specific idea in mind when they see these characters in their head. And I'm sure yeah. you've been living with them for, for such a long time. Was it a difficult search to get the key characters in place for this project? Uh, it was. Uh, it was. It was difficult to find Claire and Jamie for different reasons. I thought going into the project, I told everyone to listen. Oh, Claire's going to be the first one cast, and Jamie will be the toughest. Jamie is the king of men, which is what we call him in the writers' room. <laughs> and Claire is this smart, capable English actress. Ah, we'll find we'll find a smart, capable English actress, and Jamie will be a, a nightmare. And of course, Jamie was the first one cast, and Claire was almost the last. So it was. You, know, you never know. It's just, you know and Sam, we had no expectation we were going to land on him that quickly, but we saw his audition tape and we just went, oh my god, there he is, yeah. that's that's Jamie, and we called Diana. Yeah, yeah, so we, we found him, and yeah. he was traveling, and uh, so they said, they told me his name, and said, we're sending you the audition link so you can watch us, and it the hours before I could see it, so I was Googling him on my, my phone while my husband mm -hmm. was driving, and I was going, you're kidding, <laughs> as I'm looking at his IMPB photos, which frankly don't do him justice at all, and are some of them are downright peculiar looking, <laughs> it's really just, anyways, they wanted someone who could really literally play a 22-year-old virgin, and I said, yeah, I buy him as a 22-year-old virgin, I said, but this man looks like he doesn't have hair on his behind, let alone the dang <laughs> yeah, so it's been, it's been, yeah, so anyway, I was a little trepidatious when I got to the audition tape. So I was, I think, or so, you know, five seconds in, I said, wait, just look at anything like his photos, it was great. And five seconds more, he was gone, and it was just Jamie Fraser right there. Yeah. So, yeah, just as nice. I think That's you see what it is about actors. They have the one kind of magic, and what they do is they embody somebody that they aren't. So you know what they actually look like is not that important. You know that you have the vague general outlines, but beyond that, it's you know who they understand the character. Can they be that person? Sure. You know, and he totally could. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, uh, Tobias Menzies who plays you know, Frank Randall and Jacqueline, right? Mm -hmm. Tobias, just in the production office, and standing around going to costume fittings. It's really interesting. He literally stands and talks differently when he puts on Frank's suit than when he puts on Jack Randall's uniform. And he's not like being the character. He's not like trying to be how I am. He's not a super right. method guy and doing that. It's really subtle, but he'll put that red coat on and look in the mirror and you can just tell his posture changes 
and he holds his head slightly differently as he's talking to you about whatever, and then he goes and he gets the fedora, and, he, and he's just a different guy. There's something about there is that that moment of an actor and the, the costume and the makeup shifting them into this other person that is not them. It's really it's fascinating to watch with Tobias. It's really great. And I know you're also good friends with George R. R. Martin. Yeah. Has he given you advice on this whole new journey that you're going on? <laughs> yes, sort of. He was saying, what are they going to do for the premiere? Or do you have something to wear for the red carpet? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> I said, have you ever been on a red carpet? I said, well, yes, actually, in Bavaria about eight years ago. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, no, it's uh, mostly he tells me you know anecdotes like uh, the actor they had, the difficulties of getting people to play the hound on the mountain when you need people who are six foot eight, and how there are maybe twelve people in the world who are six foot eight and who can act, and so forth, which are not actually my problems. So, <laughs> so it tends mostly just to be an exchange of anecdotes. Well, you know, occasionally I will compare notes and say, you know, do any of the actors on your show, you know, talk to you as the author of the original source material? He says some of them do, some of them don't. <laughs> but is it fair to say, in a way, that without something like Game of Thrones showing the powers that be in Kate Cable, that there is a market out there for smart fantasy, that it might have been that much more difficult to yeah, get something no, like that? Yeah, no, George did me a big favor by oh, yeah. breaking the way. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't deny it. I mean, that's, they really change you know, people's conceptions of what you could do. In terms of, of uh, casting Katrina, did you do like a lot of chemistry tests with Sam after he was already cast to make sure that... Yeah, once yeah. we had him in place, then yeah. any actress that we were considering, seriously, we would then do a test with right. Sam and we were looking for that chemistry because this is the it's, central yeah. relationship and Katrina's audition tape was, oh my god, I think that's Claire and we all were really excited. We hoped it's going to work with sure. Sam and then put them together and they just clicked and it was, it was all set. And then the, the, the fans are, you know, always on top of everything. As soon as something was out there, they were, like, going crazy. Um, what are you, I guess, looking forward to hearing from them? That Obviously, they enjoy it, but are you worried about anything that you've done so far that is going to maybe cause a little kerfuffle or anything like that in the atmosphere? No. I mean, it'll be the same way it is when a new book of mine sure. comes out. Um, you know, huge you know, enthusiasm and so yeah. forth, but there's always this 5% minority is going Basically, I want to read Outlander again. Why didn't you read it right out? Right, right, yeah, sure. Kind of thing. And there'll be some of that. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it wears off. Yeah. You know, they read it again, and they read it again, and that's their favorite book. And I just have people write to me apologizing for what they said. Hey, <laughs> that's, nice. that's awesome. <laughs>